The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Um, welcome to the Eric Dollard uh, live interview today. Uh, this is a production of uh, AMP Electronic Media. My name is Peter Lindemann, and uh, I'll be the uh, interviewer and host today for uh, today's telecast. Um, the first thing we'd like to do, because there's sometimes a lot of uh, problems with these systems, um, this is the first time we're using um, GoToMeeting. Um, if you can see the image and if you can hear my voice clearly without echoes or anything else, um, if you would just uh, put a little note in the chat and let us know if you're having any problems. If you're not having any problems, if you can see everything clearly, and if you can hear my voice without echo, then please um, don't make a comment. And so what we'll try and do is um, work out the technical problems um, as uh, best we can early. So um, uh, in the meantime, uh, I would like to uh, just give you a little bit of a, an outline of what we're hoping to accomplish today. Um, first of all, we will be talking about um, Eric's recent conference a lecture at the uh, Bedini Lindemann uh, Science and Technology Conference uh, approximately one month ago. And uh, so we'll be talking a little bit about that and um, uh, that uh, lecture's relationship to a new book that uh, Eric has developed, which is the complete communication on that subject matter. So we'll be talking a little bit about those things. And we'll be uh, taking questions on the content of the, uh, of the lecture as well. We'd also like to address uh, some of the other uh, recent uh, allegations and uh, controversies that have been swarming around in the last month. And uh, just let you know where you can find the information on, uh, on all of these things. And if you have any questions or if you have any doubts about what the reality of that situation is, or uh, you can uh, put a, a question in the chat and uh, you can have uh, Eric answer your question directly so that your mind can be put at ease as to what the real situation is. So um, I'd like to introduce Eric. Uh, he's uh, obviously the honored guest of this interview and um, also uh, here handling all the technicals in the background is Aaron um, Murakami and uh, so uh, we're, we're about ready to begin. So uh, Aaron, are there any uh, uh, problems with the technical that people are asking about? No, uh, everybody's saying that they can hear it loud and clear, video's coming through okay, and so also if they want to raise their hands when we do open up for questions, they can also ask by audio, okay. you know, one at a time. Right. So here's, here's the situation we have. If you have an audio feed for your computer, um, what we can do is if you put a question in the chat um, and we think it's a, uh, a, a good question that everybody would be interested in the answer to, uh, you can just raise your hand uh, uh, in, in the chat and um, then we can turn on your microphone so that you can actually ask the question in an audio form live on, on this uh, uh, webinar. So um, the, the, first, um, the first thing I'd like to uh, start the interview, uh, the, the conference was a really uh, uh, amazing experience for those who were there. And um, the, uh, the, the final presentation was Eric speaking for uh, almost three hours on uh, the uh, topic of uh, four quadrant representation of electricity. And this goes back to uh, Tesla's original conception of uh, how electricity operated in these systems. And uh, he and I were having a little conversation a while uh, ago and I brought up the, uh, the quote by Tesla from 1893 where he said that he believed that um, it would be the greatest day in human history when we actually understood what electricity is. And um, 
certainly he was on the quest for uh, that discovery and um, a lot of other people were and um, uh, can you just make a few comments about that situation and where we are with using electricity today obviously electricity isn't electrons moving down wires um, well nobody really cares what electricity is anymore or wants to study so uh, corporations and the industry got what they wanted out of it so now it's kind of just all abandoned. So what I'm trying to do is to pick up the pieces and get uh, interest in electrical science going again. Of course, Tesla is the center of all this. But you can't just say that Tesla came up with this and that. In Tesla's day, it was a whole movement that was started by Michael Faraday well, many decades before Tesla even got started on this. And in Tesla's day, it was uh, you had J.J. Thompson, Thompson and, exactly. and, uh, you know, and, and other lesser known people that were all writing papers on this and doing experiments and gave us basically all the science and technology we have today but its origins are all forgotten and uh, its uh, way of presentation and development has all been uh, debased and perverted so my aim is, is to bring everything back to the original point again. The electricity has specific geometric patterns and things that can be very easily understood. So my lecture was to try to, to get that idea across to people that don't really know a lot about electricity by explaining it in analogs and archetypes and things like that and getting very heavy into the history of where all this came from. Right, so the lecture is really uh, an excellent place for almost anybody uh, with any interest in the topic uh, to start. It's uh, pretty much what will be covered in the book, but less. It, there's a lot less of the, the math and a lot less of the technical details of, of that. So Eric has, has produced a tremendous um, kind of overview for the general audience uh, on, on uh, the nature of electricity and its deep uh, roots in the natural world and uh, how all of the people who were really involved at the beginning of this, these, these people didn't think of themselves as scientists as much as just uh, uh, discoverers of natural principles and natural philosophers and, and these types of things back in the 1800s. The idea of being a scientist was not uh, really uh, an interesting idea. And um, studying how nature behaved and even understanding the underlying philosophy of nature which is where you get the idea of being a natural philosopher. That was like the pinnacle of, of knowledge. If you really understood not only what nature did, but how nature did it and why nature did it, then you really understood the philosophy of nature. And this is where all of these astonishing people like Tesla and J.J. Thompson and uh, Charles Steinmetz and others, um, they really kind of teased the truth out of the, the, these hidden corners of behavior because electricity as we use it today is not actually found in nature other than um, it's, it's inherently available um, but uh, it never shows up quite this way. Is that, that's pretty much right, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, Tesla kind of considered it an unnatural form. An unnatural yeah, form? An unnatural form, but this is what we got. Mm -hmm. So that's not to say that there aren't other possibilities or things to be discovered in electricity. Right. So that's why Tesla came up with that remark, is when that understanding was achieved, then it would be a great thing for mankind. But then, would it be? Has it been so far great? That can be questioned. Yeah, so far it's been used uh, as in a, in a very superficial way to, um, to uh, power up convenience and... Um, uh, you know, as long as people pay the power bill uh, and enjoy the convenience, then the power company really isn't interested in us knowing anything more about it. Yeah, and, and also the engineering is getting real sloppy and dangerous uh -huh. because the, the original knowledge and understandings and workmanship are all disappearing. So it's just like we were discussing earlier about the interference and all that. Is the system's becoming basically out of control. And, uh, no so, one really understands how to put these things together anymore or how to configure the transformers or uh, the safety requirements is all gone. So, so basically from the 
sociological standpoint, what I'm presenting here and talking and write about is of actually no interest whatsoever to society. Yeah, and that's that's a that's a dangerous condition we're in. <laughs> Would you not say? Yes. Yes. Now, Which you start, sometimes you head for the hills. Yeah, because... <laughs> when, you start, when you start analyzing waveforms and signals like I do and, and see what's going on inside the Earth, you find out that there's this large body of electricity that's becoming more and more out of control inside the Earth from all these aberrant power systems that are going into construction and installation. And it's a danger to the public. So let's let's go back to the uh, the roots of all this. You were you were saying in in your lecture that um, Tesla's vision of of the, the real way of of, of uh, producing and uh, transmitting electricity down wires was a um, was a four pole system, not a three phase system. He originally started off four phase, but uh... Then a special transformer bank was developed to go from this four-phase system to three-phase for long-distance transmission because it utilized less metal. Just less wires? It just three well, wires instead still, of wires? Even, even you know, normally uh, less wires means bigger wires, but it was found that three-phase uses the least amount of metal of all polyphase systems, and there really isn't an adequate explanation for that. But somehow the geometry works out that three-phase is is the way to go about it, but the natural form of electricity is four phase. Four phase. Yeah. And that so this is this goes back to um, the lecture being called uh, the four quadrant theory or the four the four sections of well, everything of everything in that manifests in electricity is related to four poles. Four poles. And we're not, right, we're that, taught in school that it's two poles and electricity is the flow of electrons and wires and all those things are not really co uh, correct and then they build up such a powerful mind virus that you can't get out of that. Right. Once you start going into more advanced studies of electricity you have all these it's kind of like believing in Santa Claus you know you're taught about Santa Claus and then one day your parents tell you that they lied to you and there is no Santa Claus and that's the most important lesson that you learn in your life is there's not only Santa Claus but there's other things like electrons. Right so um yeah, so the, the idea is, is that um, what this lecture is about is to uh, help you understand uh, the, the roots uh, in the natural world of where electricity comes from, what it is, and, and how it can behave, and a lot of the other things that have been discovered about it by Tesla and Steinmetz and some of the earlier uh, researchers, which Eric has, has studied and is probably um, the, the, the greatest living um, proponent of and probably knows more about these things than anybody else alive, certainly than anyone else I've met. And um, so uh, if we're going to bring back or even salvage um, the electrical system uh, for, for what any kind of benefit it can have for society, um, we're going to have to know these things, and there are going to have to be people who understand these things as well as Eric. And uh, so that's what this um, uh, lecture is about: to begin to give you a good introduction into the material. And uh, yeah, I should point out that that actually, you know, the four quadrant theory is a highly mathematical subject. It's pure mathematics. In fact, somebody you know was reading. Uh, comment on the internet thing that I write on that says, uh, you know, what I'm talking about is he referred to it as postgraduate mathematics work. So how am I going to explain this to a public that doesn't understand any of this stuff? And we really don't know anything about electricity at all. So what I, I'm doing in this lecture in the book is just to kind of lay the geometry and the groundwork for the whole thing so you can get an idea of the overall shape of electrical situations and the interactions. but Again, it's a you know PhD level mathematical topic, so it's going to be have that abstract nature that some people just aren't going to get. Right. Yeah. But uh, you know, in, in that sense, you know, uh, building building a you know a V8 engine from scratch is a PhD level you know uh, you know engineering uh, thing too, and that doesn't mean people can't have a a, a general understanding of how an exactly. internal combustion yeah, engine works. Kind of the same thing. Yeah, and and um, so, but it, what what we're seeing is is that. Um, society's use of electricity is obviously just exploding. It, it's, it's using electricity in ways that um, 
were never even thought of uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Well, the problem is the way it's being used also is very disruptive to the transmission system. Right. And that's become a major complication right now. And unfortunately, the electrical system is being rewired for reasons unknown in a way that enhances and aggravates the problem. And that's something that um, uh, Eric is going to be talking about in a, in a, in a future uh, publication uh, in detail. Uh, he hopes actually to uh, model all of these uh, issues and problems and, and come up with a, uh, a very, very clear thesis on what's going on with the power grid. Um, but um, one thing I wanted to um, uh, go back over, uh, I, uh, was, I had the privilege of uh, being in the edit studio uh, with the uh, uh, film um, engineer that we brought in to film uh, Eric's lecture and uh, having an opportunity to go go through the material uh, very carefully. Uh, we, we really did almost no editing on it at all and um, but going through the whole thing very carefully and um, just seeing the, the whole thing with the, with the uh, slides on the on the screen and Eric on the screen so that there's no distractions in the room or anything else I I was absolutely astonished at how much I learned that I didn't know about electricity and uh, uh, one of the things uh, that you talked about was how the the uh, the, the, the four waves um, Create what what you call the this this big uh, you know mechanical shaft of rotation down the wires. Yeah, it actually operates actually like a drive shaft, except there's no apparent physical movement. Exactly, and 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 so uh, this is one of the concepts that I had never imagined that that electricity, the way Tesla conceived it, actually had and functioned as this this large spiraling magnetic field that was was going going down and that the the rotation was actually inherent in the electricity exactly itself. yeah and yeah. see this we're all taught that that alternating current is just this fluctuation of electricity and uh, and the direct current is just this this direct movement of electricity and no one's talking about this this gigantic rotational phenomena in electricity and um, yeah, that's my point. Is alternating current's been misrepresented as a reversal of pulsation, and actually, it's a it's a shadow of a rotation. That's just one. If you look at just one part of it, it looks like shadow. an oscillation. Yeah, yeah, it looks like an oscillation, but but that's just taking a shadow of the whole thing. Right. You know, it's like the illusion, you know, that the sun rotates around the earth. Right. That's a pers that's a perspective yeah. issue. It's a projection. It's not what's actually going on. Right. So. Tesla did was initiate a magnetic vortex at the sending end and then that connected to a polyphase transmission system where the magnetism actually spirals as it propagates the velocity of light down the power line and then when that goes into the magnetic receiving device the vortex removes the motor and if you hold on to the motor or do something that wave chokes all the way back to the generator and the whole thing actually works like a rotational coupling. The power can actually bounce back and forth just like it can on a drive shaft. Like when you miss the clutch or something in your car, the thing goes into an oscillation. These are things you have to deal with in large power systems because they will go into violent oscillations like screwing up with the clutch mm -hmm. and knock everything dead. That's, you know, these big blackouts you know, usually result in some kind of oscillation that got out of control. Mm -hmm. And so these, these are very, um, so the, the, the mechanical analogs to those things are, are, are very accurate. Yeah, yeah. If you're dealing with the exact same forces, the longitudinal and transverse components, and the propagations, and it's what says it's a branch in engineering that is called dynamics. So the formulations and the geometries and the equations are are identical for all different types of dynamics. The electrical is one of the hardest to deal with because it's not accessible like a physical drive shaft. Yeah, you can't see yeah, the so. The so when you see, you know, those three big cables up on the towers with the insulators that are six or seven feet long, uh, spiraling in the space between those wires and around them, it, it, moving at 90%, at least 90, 95% uh, the velocity of light is the power of 150 locomotives, full power, lugging up uh, some grade, and there's no evidence of it other than the wires are uh, slightly pushed apart in the process when the wave passes through. 
Otherwise, that's how much power is there, and there's no way to physically perceive it, but it's quite real. And it exists in that form. It's a rotational vortex. Yeah. And it, yeah, because it's not just oscillating back and forth. There is an actual flow of power right. all the way through. Continuous flow of power does not pulsate like you're talking about alternating currents. Continuous flow of power. Right. It's constantly changing direction. Right. As it propagates, so you get a spiral down the line. You get a, you get this, yeah. this yeah, this, right. this spiral vortex going down the line, exactly. And um, so that was um, that was made just crystal clear to me, and I had never really heard anybody discuss that as as clearly as you did in the lecture. Um, there were a, a, just a whole lot of other um, aspects to the lecture that um, I was amazed at. Um, well, I, I did the, the thing which is a forbidden sit in the science and technology world is the first third of it is purely metaphysical. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I thought I thought actually that was brilliant. I was I was a little bit concerned uh, when when uh, I kind of heard that you were going to talk that way, but I it did not come across as as mystical or anything else. It came across very very um, you know directly related to the topic. And uh, I was I was actually amazed at uh, how coherently all of those themes were woven together. Well, that's how all this came about. So you know, none of this just got hatched up. It's right. And you're going. It all starts with Pythagoras, 500 to 600 BC. Right. That's where the groundwork was laid. So you can't really understand this stuff unless you go all the way back to the beginning and, and understand how it all came about. And electricity is not just somebody's notion or something that was concocted in somebody's mind while they were high on something or whatever. It was already there. Right. Any lightning storm well, will show yeah, you that it's see, already there. And when there is no lightning, it's already there. Right. Massive quantities of it. Right. <laughs> no one even knows how much. Right. So um, uh, Tesla used to say that um, uh, electricity... Uh, behaves like a, an incompressible fluid, and that the Earth is filled with 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 it. Um, he said that in an article in 1900. Um, uh, you've looked a lot at uh, the the energy in the Earth, and um, um, what's what's your idea of, of of that at this point? Well, at times there's massive rivers of electricity flowing in the interior of the Earth, particularly before large earthquakes. So I figured out a way to tap into one particular flow uh, that happens before large earthquakes, and it has produced a successful two-gate uh, advanced seismic warning system. Mm -hmm. But of course, that all got destroyed, and and I don't know how to possibly put all that back together again. Uh -huh. That's the problem: the equipment and the time, and you know, and climbing all the poles and stringing all the wire. I mean, I can do all that again. I kind of have to in order to keep you know healthy. But uh, statistically, before this decade is out, California is going to get blasted. And I no longer have a station to uh, observe all that stuff. Uh -huh. But, uh, for example, um, one of the earthquakes, uh, conveniently enough, was the epicenter was there at Landers. Uh, I wasn't at the station at the time, but other people were. And uh, they described, you know, the high-frequency waves and the other stuff the equipment was picking up. And the... Uh, the surges of current were so high uh, in the area that uh, the older uh, color TV tubes used to have an iron uh, shadow mask towards the front of the tube, and you had to demagnetize that all the time. And they had coils wound in the TV to do that. Right, the debelsers, right? Yeah, so uh, one of the people that uh, you know helped me build all this there by getting the parts and stuff, he's a um, really top-notch electronics technician and engineer in the area, works for the Marine Corps and all that. And, uh, he, analyzed all this material, and he was a TV repairman at the time, and the surges of magnetism uh, from the electricity flowing in the ground had permanently magnetized several uh, television sets in the town of Yucca Valley, and they could not be depolarized, and he sent the tubes back to the manufacturer to be analyzed and the whole thing, and uh, they'd never seen anything like it before. Wow. So, so that, that's a current of about 5 million amps flowing in the ground. Wow. So one of the and that's completely naturally yeah, generated by yeah, the Yeah, completely naturally. Process. And then during large magnetic storms, 
uh, you know, a Joey Vass, a lot of us in his real compendium probably put together the best collection of material on telluric and earth currents and actual reports of telegraph operators. And, and this stuff's going on all the time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it comes and goes. It's just like the weather. It can be quiet, and then it can build up. Uh, when there's low solar activity, then, you know, it tends to be low until an earthquake comes about. And then all of a sudden it builds up to enormous magnitudes. I picked up ionospheric scatter from uh, electrically from the earthquake in Japan two days before it happened. Wow. So um, that brings us to uh, 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 the possibility. That, are there any are there any um, questions that uh, anyone would like to at, ask uh, er Eric at this time? Uh, let's see. There's ones that are typed in, and do some of those first. Yeah. Let's let's see, let. Let's hear some of them. Let's see questions. Okay. You can just read it out. Yeah. Okay. So this is coming from somebody named Prodigal Prodigal Wizard. Okay, Prodigal Wizard. Okay. Um, for someone wishing to pursue the work of Tesla and others alike, would it be best to primarily study physics or engineering? Engineering. Stay away from physics. Yeah, engineering has always um, looked at the practical, um, you know, what happens, you know, where the rubber meets the road. That's engineering. And, and, and physics has, has really strayed off into uh, theoretical um, kind of la-la land, uh, very, very disconnected from the realities. Um, yeah, actually, physics is an antagonistic religion. Uh, it's, it's best. Those people always want to destroy Tesla's work and his ideas because it's just horrifying to them. It's a denial of their entire existence. So, uh, the best thing is, in engineering, you're going to you're going to have to deal with a more practical, experimental level. You're going to be dealing with tangible things, and then uh, the books written by engineers like Steinmetz and what have you. Or, but uh, you know, ultimately, there's no. You have to remember, I've been studying this stuff since I was six years old, and now I'm 61. So it's not like any uh, massive understanding is going to come about in a four-week period. Right. And, you know, so the idea of, of, of studying this stuff to get a degree so that you can think of yourself as an engineer and at which point you'll go out and get a job and all that kind of stuff, you still won't know anything about what's going on. Because here, here we're looking at a guy who's been studying this stuff for the last 55 years, and he's still learning about all, all of these things. The, I mean, nature's secrets are vast. And, um, you know, this is a lifetime study, not... Uh, well, also the lifetimes of the people before me. Exactly. That led to the understanding uh, that I could grasp. Exactly. So you're in my, my lecture and the book is I get into those primary people and what motivated them and how they came about these ideas and, and how horribly their ideas were received and, and you know, and harshly dealt with, and, and the misery in their lives, and because that's what seems to come out of all this, and I can attest to all of that. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to get involved in this to the level I'm involved in, it is, is the, the uh, tale of Prometheus will be true. You see, what the, 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 the big elephant in the room is that um, physics and, and, and the bankers have, have, have overlaid this economic model onto every type of knowledge, uh, whereby... Um, you know, everything has been reduced to the value of a plastic picnic fork that you use once and throw away. And uh, nature, of course, reuses things all the time, and, um, and, and uh, they just don't want us to understand how nature really behaves and how things really are connected. Well, they have a, like a pathological uh, psychosis where they actually hate nature. That's the problem is they, they despise it. Right. So, so you have to get into the writings of Wilhelm Reich. Uh, he really discusses that matter, how humans have separated themselves from life, and that's what's causing all the diseases. Right. So, uh, and yeah, yeah, definitely pursue engineering. Definitely pursue, um, you know, hands-on, anything that uh, you can actually run an experiment and, and test for yourself, to see for yourself whether what you're, what's being reported to you is true or not. Um, I would say the best thing to do is to get a hold of Faraday's experimental researches and start there. Exactly. Read, read his researches, his ideas, and do his experiments. Exactly. That's the best place to start. Right. Any of these things, even even Wilhelm Reich, you know, run the 
read the books from the from the uh, the people who did it, duplicate their experiments, and and um, you know and start there. Read read the geniuses, uh, and duplicate their work. Don't read books about them by others because most people are clueless when it comes to there, analysis. There's one really amazing character in all this is Dr. Levon. Oh yes, in uh, Gustav Levon. Yeah, Gustav Levon and. Uh, and you read his books, and the, the experiments are so simple and fundamental. There's no massive million-dollar laboratories, and the stuff is is so crude that you know I would be embarrassed to see something like that on my workbench and say that I made that thing. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, his ideas, uh, and, you know, were incredible, and he even actually managed to duplicate some of Isaac Newton's alchemical experiments, which of course will send. Any physicist in a screeching rage, and even in here mention alchemy, uh, but well, Newton didn't think like that. No, Newton. Newton was not a scientist. He was a natural philosopher and an alchemist. Um, he he wrote over a million words on alchemy, and uh, all of those um, uh, writings were essentially sequestered by uh, the Royal Society of London after his death, and they didn't actually come out until there was a gigantic. Um, uh, auction at Christie's in 1937, where all of Newton's writings on alchemy came out, and uh, it was absolutely, it was <laughs> everybody was freaked out when when all of that came out. But clearly, he wrote far more on alchemy than any other subject. Yeah, that was one of his main interests. Newton's kind of a funny character, so he was an intense paranoid, uh, a bit of a schizophrenic, and uh, really just could not. Uh, work with his contemporaries. Right. Or, he was very much a loner. Wanted yeah, to stay alone. Well, that, but, you know, Tesla did too, but nevertheless, uh, Newton really was the biggest suppressor of his own work, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. And uh, and he just kept getting this notion that other people's ideas came from him, and they stole from him, and he was in, in constant vicious fights with all the other people, and, and that just really did a lot of damage to the whole thing. Right. So, so let's take another question. Okay, this comes from Devin Drake. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is, is it your opinion that Tesla was extracting energy from the vortex flow around the Earth? Is this the same energy, possibly what makes tornadoes and hurricanes spin? Is there a tendency for this energy to accumulate and synchronize? Well, Tesla doesn't really talk about any of that. Uh, he wanted to extract energy from the environment, to use his own words. Yeah, he used the term uh, the, the uh, what the natural media. Natural media. Yeah, he used that term a lot. So uh, there's there's an electrical thing that goes on with the tornadoes and hurricanes. It's very close to the earthquakes. Uh, in fact, uh, hurricanes and earthquakes produce similar signals, and tornadoes and volcanoes produce similar signals. But I. You know, my means to analyze that are no longer existent, and I didn't really get all that together, but that's what I noticed from my observations. There's, there is a, an energy flow of some kind that generates radio frequency signals that transmit for thousands of miles in the uh, audio of what's called the ELF to DLF band. But ultimately, I can't answer if Tesla, you know, because Tesla never really told much about what he was doing. Okay. Um, Sorry, Devin. We uh, that one. That great question. Kind of beyond the scope of uh, the interview here. Okay. Here's this other question from Prodigal Wizard. Can you expand? Can you expand on what you mean by displacement current? Displacement current is the dielectric's reaction to a change in field density. So the the energy rebalancing itself causes a current to flow. But it's an ether current. It's not an electronic current. Okay. Um, let's so see. hopefully that's not too technical. Uh, when you ask a specific question like that, there is a, a technical answer, uh, and Eric just gave it. Um, so uh, what's important about the displacement current is it's a current without electrons. Uh, the question is, does it or does it not produce a magnetic field? That's an extremely important question. Uh, the Maxwellians say that it does. Uh, Tesla's uh, work says it doesn't. 
uh, that would determine the whole reality of what's going on with electromagnetism and electrostatic waves. And what Tesla is working on is to determine if a displacement current produces a magnetic field in an experiment. Uh, I'd like to do that myself, but I don't really get those opportunities because I'm not allowed to hold on to my equipment that long. Um, Another question? Okay, a question from Abbas Hachem. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. But the question is, it was said that the Tesla tower propagated energy through the earth and not the air. Is this still true? Well, exactly, even by Tesla's own word. Uh, the terminal on the top is just a reflecting capacitance to send the wave back down, and then it goes inside the earth. So Tesla built uh, almost a 300-foot cube of grounding underneath that tower, which is still there to this day, but the access to it is denied. So, so yes, the Tesla's quote wireless system was a ground propagation. It's a, it's a telluric system. system, right? Ground propagation system. Okay. Um, this is a question from Tim Gross. Professor Dollard has mentioned about an analog electrical computer producing equivalent phenomena as a real situation. Does he think some kind of analog computer network system? would be the best way to resume true basic research of electricity. Yeah, it allows you to synthesize the waveforms that are said don't exist or haven't been analyzed yet. And, and the analog uh, device will actually duplicate the effects of the Tesla transformers without the windings and uh, similar you know, complications. Because you have control over all the elements, you can produce a mathematical function precisely. So. That is, uh, as soon as I have the means to get going on anything again, that's going to be one of my first, uh, you know, lines of research is to get back into that. Great question. Um, okay, here, here's a question from Emery en Engine or Engin. Um, if a regular compass can be used to observe the magnetic component of electricity, what can be used to observe the dielectric component of electricity? You would have to have a device constructed like a compass, but the needle would have to be made out of something with a dielectric constant of at least a thousand. I don't know, like an electroscope or something like that? No, electroscope won't show direction. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, so if, if you have like the material they make these uh, super ceramic capacitors out of, and you make a, sl a small rod of that. A barium titanate yeah, or something like and that? Then, uh, and then charge it somehow. See, the thing is, is the needle and the compass is not only permeable, but it's also charged with magnetism. So you have to have like an electret. Electret on a, on a pivot. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, so that, that would be the answer. And, uh, a device that looked like a, ma a compass, except uh, instead of being a, a magnetized pointer, it would be an electrat. Right. Electrostatically. Yeah. Instead of magnetically charged, it would be dielectrically charged. And instead of being magnetically permeable, it would be dielectrically permeable. Right. So iron has a permeability of a thousand, so you would have to get a dielectric that has that same kind of ratio right. compared to free space. So it's going to want to be super ceramics. And then you have to figure out a way to polarize it. Some of them will hold the charge without any metal terminals. So right. Uh, that's, there's so many formulas and species available of that stuff that, that I'm sure there's something out there that will work perfectly. Right. So, okay. great question. Okay, this is a question from Sebastian Bowles. Mr. Dollar, do you, do you consider the Tesla transformer to be the most important apparatus in replicating Tesla's work? So if anyone wanted to try to get into experimenting with Tesla's patents, is it essential that they get the Tesla transformer built right? That's the key to all Tesla's work, is that transformer. That's why he was able to advance beyond everybody else, because his devices were so highly perfected. So that transformer serves as a transformer from electromagnetism to the dielectric field, and you have to make that transformation before you can begin to study the dielectric field. Okay, um, let's see. Here's a question from Philip Hobbs. Is the solar flares the reason why the UK power network is getting so many faults? Well, the solar flares oh. are pretty dead right now. In fact, actually, it's kind of scary how, dust, how dead the sun's getting. 
So it uh, might be something else going on there, uh, bad engineering, or maybe it's just overly susceptible to the solar activity. It's not the solar activity directly that causes the disruption of the power systems. It's the telluric currents that the solar flare generates that disrupt the power system by getting up to the transformer neutrals. So one of the things we, that Eric and I were talking about today was um, how the, the system, the high voltage and low voltage neutrals have been mixed uh, here in the United States and maybe that's part of uh, the problem that he's seeing. Because yeah, that makes the system much more susceptible to a nuclear EMP and telluric surges. Right. It invites it. Right. So it makes it, it it's destabilizing. Destabilizing the system. The system. Yeah. So there, there there may well be a reason you're seeing what you're seeing and we're you know, without you know a, a significant observation on site, we wouldn't we wouldn't know for sure. But there may well be um, very good reasons, and your data may be accurate. Well, it's, it sounds interesting, and there should be more material found out presented on that subject. That's exactly. important. Yeah. Okay. This is a question from uh, Boris Jovanovic. Can Eric build a device that provides free energy and what he personally thinks is the probability of him doing that, 10, 60, or 90 percent? What's all needed for that? Thank you and hi everybody. Boris from Norway. No, I don't really have any, any perfected free energy device. In fact, I've had to distance myself from even talking about that idea because of all the negative energy it brings along. But I have seen, uh, as Peter and I and uh, Michael Knotts and Chris Carson did a demonstration of a rotating apparatus, uh, which I think is very well uh, known about. Now, on the videos that have gotten out, what are termed as the Borderland videos, and, and the device uh, had every appearance of uh, invalidating the law of conservation of energy. There was no relationship between the energy in and the energy out. And there was one point where under worst case circumstances, with all the errors subtracted in the favor against us, we determined the machine had 108% efficiency uh, as an electrical device with that much leakage and resistance and windage and hysteresis and all that. It should have never operated above 70% efficiency. So we're 50. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a plastic prototype for God's sakes. So it was. Um... So and then you know I have this. Uh, a voltage converter thing in my car that was made in World War II that bounces two capacitors between each other to make 12 to 24 volts and there have been times that I can't turn it off. And I have noticed that it tends to, it will run one of the small toy radio devices in the car, a small uh, unit in radio, probably pulls maybe 200 milliamps and the thing has seemed to power it. But uh, as far as, you know, anything that I can take to L.A. Department of Water and Power, you know, we put up a building and bolt it to the floor, it's not happening. Yeah. And they would love to have that, but uh, it's just not there. And uh, so I'm only approaching the theoretical standpoint. Uh, my idea was to lay a mathematical basis for this so that from that mathematical and theoretical understanding, somebody could come up with something that does produce uh, what I call energy synthesis. Uh, the other thing, which is an obvious break in the energy loop, is this hydrogen process where people are using radio frequency waves and dealing with uh, water dielectrically rather than conductively. And instead of breaking it apart by electrolysis, they're breaking it apart by some kind of molecular or dielectric dissociation, and no energy is required to separate the water. And then when you recombine the hydrogen and oxygen, it's a thermodynamic process. So the law of conservation of energy is violated in that situation, and numerous people have accomplished that. So in that sense, uh, that's the only so-called free energy I know about, and I would pursue people, if they want to follow a course that's probably going to lead to something that works, I'd go that route. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that, Eric, is, is that uh, Tesla was, was never said that his, his devices, you know, created energy. You know, Tesla was an absolute adherent to the law of conservation of energy. Absolutely. So, but, but he was also a complete adherent to um, the, the idea that nature was just loaded with so much energy that could be tapped. Well, so you take it from a practical standpoint, is the Earth is rotating at 1,000 miles an hour. At the equator. Yeah, right. so that means that basically we're all moving, you know, 
thousand miles an hour through space. Everything in this room is moving a thousand miles an hour through right. space. And then there's a 25,000 mile an hour component as the Earth moves around the sun. And then there's a 100,000 mile an hour component as the solar system moves through space. So if you take uh, any object that's in this room, you know, the button on my shirt, okay? <laughs> this thing moving at 250,000 miles an hour, if it hit you in the side of the head, you'd be feeling funny if you even had a head left or if anything in the neighborhood was even left. Right. So Tesla's aim was to figure out how to uh, extract the latent energy that's right. intense and it's all around us. Right. He said that we would, we would hook our, our machines to the wheelwork of nature, not that we would create energy out of nothing, but that there was so much energy available in the natural world that, that uh, siphoning a little bit of it off to run our machines was not going to slow down nature at all. And that, so, so it, 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 what's important for you and your quest for a free energy machine isn't to, is, is specifically stop looking in the wrong places. Don't wait for somebody to come up with some little plate that converts tachyons to uh, light LEDs or something like that. That's all nonsense. There is just vast amounts of energy uh, everywhere, and um, there's lots of things available to tap into it. But I do believe that energy synthesis is possible, and uh, it was stated as such in, a, uh, in the 1890s, a uh, American Institute of Electrical Engineers meeting with Tesla's president, Steinmetz president, uh, Professor William Anthony was there. They had quite a party, and they, uh, Anthony was the MC of the thing. And at the end, he stated that within a year, uh, they really felt that they were going to have some kind of energy synthesis process yeah, they available. Said basically, that they would have a free electricity. That they used those terms. Yeah, a self a self sustaining electrical system is Correct. the way they looked at it. Because after the mathematics of Steinmetz, there's a lot of implications there. Correct. And that's why GE jokingly said they gave uh, Steinmetz permission to create electricity from the square root of minus one. And that basically is the centerpiece of my whole lecture. Right. And that, that, that comes right back to um, the lecture that Eric just gave a month ago. Um, yeah, but the idea that uh, you can create a, a, um, a standalone a, a, a device that, that looks like it's a machine that produces um, electricity seemingly from nothing doesn't mean that that's what it is. It's like the shaft of power that's going down the, the, the wires. You can't, you can't actually see that the fact is, is that the electricity is available in nature. We're not, we're not creating it out of nothing. And, and, and just because the, the box might be able to be connected to appliances that we might want to power doesn't mean that we've actually uh, you know, uh, created the electricity out of nothing. It's still, it, the box is, is embedded in the natural world and it's, it's interacting with all of these forces. That's and, the way Tesla looked at it. Exactly. So, any other? Yeah, there's actually quite a few questions. Um, it's about 12 to noon. Great. Okay, however long we want to go. Um, there are questions regarding the recent happenings. Okay. I don't know if we want to go into any, any of that yet, or? Well, we can we can, we can can move into that if we want to take some, some questions. Well, let's go for a few more technical ones. Yeah. That's kind of. Okay. Okay, here's a question from uh, John Capaletti. Uh, if the magnetic field represents a flow of energy along its field lines like a spiraling current around a wire, does, does the dielectric field represent a flow of energy along its own straight lines? It's, uh, it's within its lines. The dial, uh, magnetic is around in its lines, but the dielectric is within its lines. It's, that's where the, the idea of counter space comes through. So it's, it's a flow in counter space, but it's more of a stress. Magnetism is considered an actual flow or circulation, and dielectric is considered a stress. But if you alter that stress, then you get displacement currents. So there is a propagation. So when there's a change in potential, that change in potential has to propagate, but how that propagates is an unknown. That has never been resolved. That was the world of Tesla, and te Tesla never created equations or wrote books. So it takes us back to the uh, original idea of displacement current with Maxwell and using that as a transmission media. 
So the flow in the dielectric field would have to be a result of variation, but the flow in magnetism is inherent in the process of magnetism itself. Okay. Um, you were trying to take an audio question? If that works. I think we're doing fine. Well, okay. We'll yeah, we'll score these. Okay, let's see. Let's see how we got four hours worth of questions yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. This is another question from Tim Gross. Are there any plans for a verser and symbolic operations course to deprogram those of us who have been trained to think in calculus? That's what my whole lecture is about. That's what the lecture is about, and that's and what the, the book, book to follow, yeah. follow will, will, is that course. Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, as far as learning the basics of electrical theory, the Lone Pine writings are, are the place to begin. And then we'll have those um, republished shortly. Okay. Here's a, uh, let's see. Uh, here's a question from Steve McKinnon. Have you done any research in John Keeley and his study of vibratory physics? Not a lot, because there really doesn't seem to be a lot of material available. So instead, I went back to Helmholtz. That's who Tesla studied, was Hermann von Helmholtz. Okay. Um, here's a question from Nanya B. What is the highest COP coefficient of performance available from circuits available in the public domain that you know about? I have no knowledge of any of that. Um, yeah, right now, um, electrically, um, uh, the COP of, of circuits just coming out, um, we've got COPs of close to two coming out you know, with uh, lighting controls and motor controls from uh, Flyback uh, Incorporated. Uh, those things are just starting to hit the market now. Uh, any, uh, they, they've got circuits that will power any inductive load and re, re, uh, return the, uh, um, the inductive collapse for reuse. Um, so uh, these, these things are coming. Uh, so CO, COP, uh, electrical circuits with COP above one are, are about to hit the market, um, but they're um, uh, you know, they're, they're not here yet. Okay. Here's a question from Simon Davies. My question, um, does Eric recommend building a scaled down TMT for 1860 KC? And what was the exact, uh, the exact end operating frequency with extra coil? So that would be the Tesla Mac. Well, 18, 18, I picked 1860 because that's the 100th harmonic of the Alex Anderson system of Boleus, which was 18.6. Uh, 1860 is a licensable frequency. All you have to do is get a ham radio license. Uh, it operates in what's called the 160 meter band, which is uh, beyond the availability of hams to use electromagnetically because the antenna structures are too massive electromagnetically. So I suggested that as a ham radio starting point in uh, telluric transmission and put out a lot of stuff on the internet already about that. Okay. Um, here's a couple questions about um, uh, Gustav Le Bon, uh, wondering how, how his name is spelled. Uh, Levon is uh, a capital L-E, capital B-O-N. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, this is a question from Adam Bull. Uh, can Eric talk about the 1917 Global Readjustment Campaign of Radio? and the multiple loaded flat top antennas longitudinal wave, which disappeared post-1917. And what part did Marconi might have played in using the possibly faster than light wave technology of Nikola Tesla, which he claimed could move regardless of distance? Yeah, that's a very lengthy and complicated question. 
Uh, that's why my what I call my RCA book is coming out. Yeah, that's all addressed in there, isn't and, it? And uh, I gave two lectures to the San Francisco Tesla Society on this matter. It took me months to assemble, and they censored them. So, so we're going to try. And so do what I can too. say is, uh, uh, judging from the uh, emission patterns on Marconi's antennas, which are basically an extremely bastardized version of the Tesla system, uh, the radiation patterns indicate that the test the antennas were not transmitting electromagnetically. Uh, the Alexanderson antenna further tuned out the electromagnetic component uh, to satisfy the patent office and uh, the powers to be. He uh, falsely claimed that it was electromagnetic, but then it is technical and theoretical statements that have no resemblance to anything electromagnetic at all. Uh, in the RCA book, and some of this stuff's already come out, I think uh, John Polakowski uh, just released all the handwritten part of that book uh, several months ago where the complete calculations for the Bolinus, uh, Alexanderson, and Marconi antenna were developed uh, there in black and white, and uh, they show that the electromagnetic component is so in, is so insignificant that it's not even worth considering the heat losses and other things over power the electromagnetic. So they were not using electromagnetic process. Uh, the thing uh, that that really tripped off the whole ban and all the complications is the Navy just finally got tired of being ripped off by all the forest and Marconi and uh, they wanted a working Tesla system and they couldn't get a working Tesla system. They just got junk, things that didn't work. Uh, so why when World War II, uh, World War I came about, uh, uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, uh, produced one of his first snaky political moves. This is why the Secretary of the Navy was absent. Uh, he colluded and the Navy outlawed radio. We were not allowed to own any radio parts or antennas or anything. Outlawed the whole thing, uh, uh, froze all the patents, and then uh, RCA uh, was formed out of General Electric and the United States Navy to be the patent holder to stop all the endless patent suits, uh, to stop people from getting ripped off by things that didn't work, uh, the jamming and the interference of everybody monkeying around with this and that, it just created an impossible mess. So, the Navy basically just put a stop to the whole thing and uh, unfortunately threw the Navy out with the bathwater and screwed themselves out of Tesla. Uh, I don't know if they realize that to this day, but they screwed themselves out of Tesla and they created RCA and then Sarnoff, Marconi's uh, operating manager, gained control of the corporation and beat every radio inventor and television inventor into the ground thereafter. But I can't complain because Sarnoff's country, uh, company was my patron and provided me with all the facilities and knowledge and materials I needed for my research. So, But it's bad in one phase, it is good in another. But then when Sarnoff died, that ended everything and now everybody got a mess. Okay. Um, next question is from Mike Goldman. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Question. Okay. Uh, let's see. Would you can okay from Mike Goldman? Would you consider making an analog computer kit for people to purchase and support your work and learn hands-on how to build and use dielectric circuits? Yeah, that would be a possibility, but I'm not really at that point right now. I'm struggling just to, you know, even do anything. It would probably be easier to, um, you know. Uh, to put out a, uh, a, a downloadable book that would teach you what to buy and, and, and how to build it yourself. Well, there, is, there are handwritten uh, chapters at the end of the RCA book that actually give constructible networks made out of real coils and capacitors. So it would just be a matter of getting no size capacitors and no size coils. Uh, there are some people in the energetic form that have been fooling around with this. Uh, it's, it's not that hard to do. Uh, I mean, for me to be building kits and all that, right now I'm struggling, uh, you know, particularly with all this, this bad stuff that people are directing at me just to keep, you know, my most fundamental basic projects together, which are um, right now just about in the same primitive level as Faraday and Maxwell. I'm not in a position to do much of anything right now other than, you know, just keep my nose above water. Yeah, so I, I think the idea that um, any of us are going to be producing kits, um, you know, for hobbyists is probably very low. Um, and uh, the information on how to do it, 
uh, is going to be, is is uh, in the process of being published with some of the books that uh, Eric's talking about. And um, well, there's the Borderland videos too that actually correct. show that actually show yeah. the the systems right. right. So um, yeah, you'll just have to learn it from from those things and and start your research from there. So we we really can't promise um, the uh, production of a kit at any time in the future. Okay. Uh, here's a um, a question from Ted Stoltenberg. Uh, would Professor Dollard have use of a Hewlett Packard Spectrum Analyzer circa 1980s as crystal time base stabilized in its own oven? If it works. Okay. So you might be offering to donate that to your lab or something. Yeah, I mean, if it works, that would be. I prefer the older uh, vacuum tube stuff, but. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, I do need a spectrum analyzer that works. I, I tend to stay away from the more modern equipment because when something goes wrong with it, it's not repairable or it's too difficult to figure out what's wrong with it. Okay. Right, all the microcircuits. Yeah, yeah, it just gets to a point where, you know, I mean, it's not practical. A lot of the complicated stuff I don't really need. I'm looking for more basic stuff, but but nevertheless, I, you know, I do need to get spectral analysis equipment uh, for my waveform studies and, and a lot of my research is involving music. That was my intent, actually, uh, when I got started in a laboratory situation is I was going to uh, spend more time with the Pythagorean and the musical waveforms and those type of things and not get involved in, in a bunch of other stuff that, you know, wanted to expand out. I don't even know what any of it means right now. It's going out in my name. Okay. So, um, Ted, you can probably make contact through the forum. Just post something in the Eric Dollard thread or... Um, yeah, there's people there that'll, you know, if you mention the analog computers or any of that stuff, I mean, there's people on the energetic forum that might not be posting, but they are working on it. And if you ask for help, I'm sure somebody will, will show up to help you. Right. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. Do you want to do a few more questions? Yeah, just that? a few more technicals, and then we'll move into the other stuff. Okay, um, this is a question from Roger D. Witt. In, in Tesla patent number 723188, the title is Method of Signaling. Um, is the method of signaling patent really the flying saucer patent given that the two antennas share common hardware hardwire connections? Well, there's nothing there that I know that connects to any flying saucers. Okay. Yeah, the, the method of signaling patents show basically a ground propagation system. They show uh, his mechanical PWM uh, controllers. They show, um, um, you know, th those types of uh, components. Uh, um, so I don't, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about there. Okay, let's see. It's a long one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Is there, okay, um, this is a question from Jeff Havel or Havel. Um, it's good to see you two working again um, together. I hope you're well. Is there a specific book or source of information for understanding some of Tesla's work, such as his transformer? Not really, other than what little I put out. It's one of the most, uh, it's one of the least understood devices in existence and one of the most misrepresented. And pretty much you can uh, rest assured that anything that's written or available on that subject is going to be misleading, unfortunately. It's all wrong. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a number of people. There's a guy in Europe who's claiming to have uh, well, the wireless system. Mile, mile care. My, yeah. yeah. It's got yeah. everything all screwed up. Yeah, that, 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 that's up. not how Tesla did it. Um, there's there's a, a whole bunch of different um, uh, things. There's a number of threads on the, on the uh, energetic forum where people are talking about uh, the Tesla magnifying transmitter. And again, um, you know, various people, including myself, have gone in there and, and shown uh, the original article on uh, by Tesla, where he shows that um, uh, that really uh, what's being propagated is a pressure wave. He shows that the transmission is a pump, and the the Earth is a ball, and all the receivers are big are, are pressure gauges, really. And so every time he pumps the pump, 
every pressure gauge goes like this, and it's an instantaneous wave propagation in, through the Earth. He's very, very clear about it. All of the analog, all, all of the analogies he used. Yeah, that that brings up an important part. Is people are always going faster than light waves and speed and all that. But the important thing to understand with Marconi and Alex Anderson and Tesla's work, and that might be why there's so much opposition and suppression of all that work, is there is no velocity to right. the waves. It's instantaneous. Think, well, it's not instantaneous. No. There's no velocity. Okay. It's in another dimensional relationship that's not understood. It's not velocity. It tricks you into being velocity. So Tesla points out in his diagram uh, where he shows this, you know, the Earth is a balloon and all these things. And, and he shows it as a, um, the velocity is different in different places. So it's infinite in one spot and the speed of light of the other, which means that there is no real velocity. Uh, that's what I wrote about uh, uh, analytically in the RCA book is it's actually it's not length divided by time it's length multiplied by time so now you've got a whole different dimensional relationship that no longer relates to speed and that's the complication so we can't say faster than light communications we can say it's it's not a communications that involves velocity oh, but, there, but there is going to be an expected time shift none of these things are being studied right um, here's a question from Sterling Allen. Uh, it seems that this forum of questions and uh, Q&A is very helpful for, pe for people. Would you consider doing this on a weekly basis or at least a monthly basis? Well, I mean, this is not my normal habitat. So, right. you know, once I go back in the bushes, I mean, it's pretty much just what I write. But I could try to do this again, but it's not economical for me right. you know, to travel a great distance. And then, you yeah. know, and I can answer yeah, Eric basically lives 500 miles from here, so uh, this is, that. yeah, so... Um, I can answer. Sure. Okay, um, to do this video, Eric Eric doesn't even own a computer um, down at his lab or anywhere else, and so um, he's just up here in town for a short period of time. That's why we're able to do the live video interview. Uh, when he is back um, down south, uh, we might be able to do this over a conference call. You know, where you can dial in with a PIN code and... Well, that um, worked uh, because we did that not too long ago. Yeah, and, and yeah. so, you know, people can ask questions and, and we can unmute it and ask questions, you know, people can ask questions and stuff. It won't be by video setting, but that is something that we could do long distance uh, when Eric is not here. It just won't be by video, it'll just be over a phone call. So Yeah, we could do that once a month. You know, so something like that once a month we can, yeah, I guess, good. look at doing yeah. that. So. It's a good idea. Okay. Um, any other technical questions? There's a there's like hours worth. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, um, thank you so much, everybody, um, for your interest and your participation in in this. We've been going uh, for about an hour now um, on on the technical uh, information, and we really appreciate your interest and support. Um, there is another topic we wanted to uh, touch on a little bit. And that is uh, a lot of the other uh, emails and videos and, and allegations and, and uh, disruptions that have been happening over the last 30 days. And we wanted to address uh, that a little bit as well. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is that um, uh, all of the allegations uh, that have been made against Eric and Aaron uh, at this point uh, have been uh, demonstrated to be false. Um, uh, they have done some damage, but uh, basically we really appreciate your support and, and your ability to see through um, all of the lies and um, the disruptions that have been generated around, around the situation. Um, you can see here in this, in this format, uh, Eric is here on his own free will. He's, uh, he's healthy, he's lucid, um, so all of the uh, uh, the allegations that uh, he's uh, whacked out on drugs and all kinds of other things. These things have been completely debunked by the people closest to uh, the person who was uh, making those allegations. And uh, just so you can see with your own eyes and hear with your own ears that uh, that is not the state that Eric is in. And um, so uh, we've put um, uh, a lot of that information in uh, previous 
um, uh, videos that are on YouTube right now and links to those if you haven't seen them or if you continue to be interested or if you want to just ignore them, that's fine too because um, it's, it's really a distraction for Eric doing his work. Uh, but all of the, the links for those can be found at the, at the new website, ericpdollard.com. And um, uh, that will be the, uh, the, the new central website w um, that will be hosted by us. So that uh, and, and at this point, we're, we're trusted supporters of Eric. And um, we're not going to be answering emails in Eric's name. And, and we're not going to be doing all of these other things that have been done um, to uh, really uh, destroy uh, Eric's um, reputation and uh, just a, a vast number of things have happened that uh, Eric didn't know anything about uh, and, and were done in Eric's name uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're doing everything we possibly can to put a stop to all of those things. So uh, ericpdollard.com uh, uh, will have um, links to all of those things that will have a link to this um, interview uh, as soon as it's, um, uh, the recording is made available and processed. Uh, and also, um, there is going to be a link at that, at that website for you to purchase um, uh, a copy of Eric's um, lecture at the conference, uh, where uh, Eric will get the, uh, uh, the, the largest uh, amount of the uh, proceeds from that if you buy it from that link. So um, we're, we're hoping that uh, instead of asking for donations and begging for money and all these other things, what we want to do is we want you to learn as you help. And so we're uh, making uh, these materials available. And uh, so the first thing you can do that will really be of assistance to us is if you buy um, a copy of the lecture that Eric gave at the conference uh, from the link that's available at ericpdollard.com. Oh. So, uh, yeah, and if anybody does want to send donations directly to Eric, the uh, by you know cash, check, money order, whatever, there is an address on ericpdollard.com, and and that gets straight to Eric, and occasionally he'll check that mail, and so that that goes directly to him. And that money will go to you know his personal use to help him out, and he will also use that money to to, to support the projects at the lab, right. which is going forward. Right, the lab is moving forward. Um, most of the people who have been um, trying to disrupt those activities are are becoming marginalized and will hopefully be permanently re relieved of their uh, uh, interaction with the laboratory, so that Eric's work can continue. Uh, without um, disruption. And um, so all of those things are in the works. We really, really appreciate any of your help to make uh, the ericpdollar.com site go viral. So tell your friends about it and, um, uh, you know, and, and feel free to support Eric in that way. Because uh, we want to support you as well uh, by helping you understand uh, what's going on in this field, and um, uh, so um, we can take some uh, uh, questions, questions at this time. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there's not a whole lot regarding the stuff that's right. going on, but um, here's one from Sterling Allen. Okay. Uh, my main question is: Okay, dusting off from the recent fallout of recent conflicts. Is Eric going to somehow resume work at EPD Labs? Well, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, the, the the building and um, that that process is is still being sorted out, um, and um, we uh, we really have to see whether or not um, uh, sufficient funds can be brought together to uh, buy out the previous partners. Um, there's obviously a fair amount of, uh, of um, there's, there's some debt associated with the building. There's some uh, other costs associated with uh, uh, some 
some uh, material upgrades to the uh, facility, and if um, if the people who put in those funds could be um, compensated, then they would step out. So um, that's probably the the greatest thing that could be of help if if uh, if fun, if sufficient funds could be generated in the next six months to to uh, facilitate that, then then that would probably clear the way completely for Eric to work on, on uh, um, you know, undisturbed at the, at the lab. Yeah, and there, and there will probably be some campaigns, like an Indiegogo kind of thing, to continue this. Um, and, you know, with anything dealing with the lab, we really don't have any part in any of that, and that's between Eric and the people he's working with in the, in the nonprofit. Right, yeah, Aaron and I are not involved in the lab process. Uh, we're just functioning as uh, Eric's publishers. And, uh, but, so that's why I should point out, that's why there's all this trouble right now. Uh, this has happened repeatedly, uh, as is known. It's always uh, set up that I'm the fall guy, I'm some drug user crazy uh, that uh, does whatever. And, uh, and then they get all my stuff and they defame my name. And normally I have no recourse, I have no money. I'm left destitute somewhere on the street and uh, nobody will help me. Uh, this time it worked out a little differently. Uh, uh, this plan uh, to basically uh, do this again to me uh, was oddly enough disclosed to somebody, uh, not realizing that that somebody had more intelligence than they were given credit for. And then at the same time, I got associated here with Aaron. And right now, a lot of my suppressed material, I mean, we, we're still going through stuff that, uh, that we dug up that uh, has been banned or suppressed or screwed with for some of it almost 20 years. And now all that's getting out, and I have a bit of a defense force. And these forces that want to disrupt all of my work are, uh, are in high gear right now. Uh, they weren't expecting this. They thought I was just going to go away. Uh, they had, uh, had worked on uh, in my intelligence gathering. They had worked for months uh, to compile defamatory letters to send officials I work with and my business partners, and, uh, and the whole thing went wrong. And now these people are just going to go full bore on the Internet to uh, cook up whatever they can. But it seems to me, uh, basically, they're just showing their own, own colors of what kind of people they are. They're outrageous. Uh, the sad thing is, is how many small-minded people there are out there that just get wrapped up in the whole thing without even knowing what's going on. It's enough to make me go drive off in the bushes and never talk to anybody again. And that's exactly what these people are trying to do. So, um, you know, so that's that's what we're that's what we're up against, folks. We're we're really asking you to, um, you know, take a breath and um, look at, you know. Who is, whose actions are really supporting Eric and whose actions are really, you know, defaming and disrupting Eric. And, and uh, if, you, if you just look at things uh, of that way, then I think you'll see the truth very, you know, in, in a very simple dimension. See, and the problem is, you know, when, when this future material we've been talking about comes out, uh, this is going to get stepped way up. It's going to start coming out of other neighborhoods, so it's important the public uh, see on this first wave what's going on because there's going to be a second wave that's going to be even more severe. And it's time to uh, start paying attention to this stuff. Uh, th this time now, the uh, defamation and destruction of Eric Dollard and his work will be live for everybody to see. I feel satisfied in that. Um. And, and there's two interviews on YouTube that I did right. uh, with Eric. The, the links to those are on ericpdollar.com, which right. addresses one particular individual, and another one addresses these um, false copyright, uh, claiming that these copyright claims are false. Right. Uh, Eric did request that I had his copyrighted material removed off of certain websites, and um, this person is making it look like I'm filing these in Eric's name without Eric knowing and that they're false. Uh, not only did he not, um, not only did that material not remain taken down, but it was put back up and that individual is encouraging other people to break the law uh, and, and spread it around. You know, and so 
that's the kind of stuff we're dealing with, but anybody can feel free to go to ericpdollar.com, look at those two YouTube links, and all that stuff has been addressed, and it doesn't have to be discussed again. Yeah, we don't want to go over things that have already been um, uh, you know, put in a, yeah. a very clear communication, and then just realize that anything that's come out from these sources uh, is, um, you know, uh, what Eric, um, you know, wants done, and... Um, uh, he's 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 the one who is uh, the driving force here. All we're all uh, Aaron and I are trying to do is, is play a supporting role. Um, here's a question from Damian Meeker. I donated some money the last day of the conference to the lab. Are the donations lost now that the officers of the corporation are changing? Well, the bank account should still be intact. So, but so, I don't know. I, I'm, I've lost control of all this, so I don't know what's going on. I have to. That's why it's best at this point just to send the money to me in the mail. And the address is on ericpdollar.com. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, we, we don't know the, the answer to um, that question, and that's why uh, we are instituting alternate channels at this point for, for those people who want to continue support. Okay. Um, Here's a question from Jason Poteet. What's the purpose of the lab? I'm missing context since I wasn't able to attend the conference. Well, the purpose of the lab, the lab was never even supposed to be made public. So that's a complication. Uh, there's projects that I'm working on that, that I consider confidential. Uh, a lot of it involves this telluric work. Uh, there's things that just can't be made public. Uh, you know, now that whole security situation has been crashed. Uh, the public's uh, interest in stock in the lab is, is to build this uh, 20,000 watt peak envelope power cosmic conduction generator that will make anything that uh, Hollywood cooked up look uh, pale in comparison to. But that's a lengthy, expensive project. And unfortunately, all this disruption uh, is a large quantity of donations that were to be provided and equipment for that has have now been canceled. So that put a stop to that. Uh, the private donations that I'm receiving from people in the mail right now are paying for the Telluric project, which is slowly and methodically moving forward. Uh, it has uh, the appropriate uh, governmental support. I have the financial support from the public. Uh, the materials are all available. There's not really a lot. It's just wire and insulators and wooden poles. Uh, it's a lot of work involved, but the technology is basic and simple. This stuff is just laying this junk out in the desert, and that project is, is moving forward. Right now, it's, we're just basically waiting out the heat. So when it cools off, we can go back out there and start working in the field again. That project is advancing very well, and the uh, the public support money is um, really appreciative that that is funding this project, and now that's a self-contained operation that uh, ultimately uh, can I can do without the building on that because most of it's outside plant. But that means I'll have to do the whole thing out of my car in the desert, like I have for the past 30 years, and I would like to make it a little easier than that because I'm not really going to live long enough to spend another 30 years building equipment. I got to get it all done in a short period of time. Okay. Um, okay, here's a question from uh, Gary Hendershot. Given that the principal fundraiser is now persona non grata and revenue from publications and speaking engagements have been diverted to personal use, what method of continued financial support do you envision for the continued operation of EPD Labs? Are there any projects planned for the near term? for the near term that might generate a revenue stream to support the continued operation at the lab? Uh, there are certain projects that could be uh, developed. Uh, I mean, one thing is I put these projects out on the energetic form, uh, particularly uh, two of them relating to the duplication of Tesla's work. Uh, I had the idea of uh, this thing that I I call the cosmic ray detector is actually making them and making them available to the public. Uh, the problem is, is the parts are getting hard to find, and it's I can't really use up all the available resources and, and send them out for money or not because then there won't be anything left for me to do my experiments with. Uh, 
So it's kind of hard to say. Like I say, the, the laboratory was mainly uh, conceived as myself as a, a reestablishment of the Bell Telephone Laboratory's presence. Uh, consisting primarily of a board of directors and individuals with some kind of Bell Telephone background or experience. And then there's, in the area I'm in, there's various industrial and military and governmental and commercial interests that, you know, I'm a laboratory and I'm there uh, to do things and that was the intent of EPD Laboratories was to get involved in that. Uh, you know, a big mining company or somebody is not going to want to have all this stuff, you know, broadcast on the air, why it's being developed or whatever, it can't be talked about. Uh, the telluric thing, uh, you know, I mean, I can't, you know, just get on the air and, and play Chicken Little and wave my hands and say the earthquake's coming, the earthquake's coming, that's not the right way to do business, it's a civil defense thing, it's specifically for the utility companies and, and uh, fire departments and, and emergency services people, so so EPD Laboratories really is not a, a Disneyland presentation of electricity, uh, but being that the public has provided a large quantity of money and, and seems to continue to like the idea, the cosmic, so-called cosmic induction generator is uh, a direction to go. It's very expensive and time-consuming. It's important to do, and the public is of that. And, and I think that's, uh, that's going to be the public side of EPD Laboratories, and then Possibly later, you know, the time and people and materials permitting is then these things that people are asking about analog computers and start to do a thing again like with the old Borderland videos. So that's a distinct possibility so that there's a public service aspect, media aspect of this as well as its actual uh, laboratory, you know, situation that has to operate in that reality which might not necessarily involve any public disclosure and obviously from everything that's happened uh, being tricked into uh, uh, these videos and stuff is public disclosure ultimately is a very deleterious uh, situation uh, for my operating so I'm tending uh, not to be interested in much of that anymore so it's a complex situation really it's hard to give a definite answer to I think the bottom line is is that um, uh, the problem isn't the funding source uh, as far as EPD, uh, EPD labs uh, because there is so much interest in the community from, from a professional clientele that as soon as the, all of the, the problems and uh, disruptions go away, uh, EPD labs can easily settle down into uh, a, uh, a very stable um, you know, a business interaction with the people who are wanting to uh, take advantage of Eric's services, and so that's that's not a, that's not an issue. Uh, the main thing we have to do is stop all the disruption and uh, and uh, get people involved in the uh, uh, corporate structure of EPD Labs um, that are supportive of Eric's. Uh, agenda. Um, well, that's that's about all the questions as okay. far as uh, the the lab stuff and Great. and the recent things going on. Um, Great. Uh, it, we've we've been we've been going about an hour and a half. Um, it'll be at two thirty when the links go live okay. for the new presentation. Great. Great. Um, we really appreciate um, all of your. Uh, interest and support in uh, your participation in this um, live interview with Eric Dollar. Um, this is a, a really a great opportunity for you to see what's going on, what uh, what the truth is, and um, uh, this um, this broadcast will be made available. Again, the link will be on ericpdollar.com. Um, the the link to uh, begin purchasing uh, the conference films, uh, which will consist of two one-and-a-half-hour downloads. Uh, those, that link will be on ericpdollar.com uh, at uh, 2.30 uh, West Coast time. And um, that is the complete uncut um, uh, presentation of Eric giving the lecture 
He takes questions during the lecture. Uh, he takes a lot of questions after he finishes his uh, prepared uh, comments, and uh, everything is there. Uh, we didn't we didn't lose anything, and um, so we really appreciate uh, your support. Um, this this film set is definitely the beginning of of uh, you know the understanding of the material that's in the book. We really hope to have that book fully fully developed uh, at the publisher level and available by the end of the summer, maybe possibly as late as early fall of this year. So we're going to be getting that out as soon as possible, and um, uh, and we'll probably have two other uh, publications by Eric uh, made available in that time frame uh, that are in. Uh, uh, post-production right now. So uh, we hope to be able to create a steady stream of uh, the best work of this guy for the last uh, five years um, and, and make it available in um, uh, you know, easy, easy to get, um, highly condensed and uh, well presented uh, form uh, so that you can learn this science uh, as quickly and as correctly as possible. Uh, any any closing comments, anyone? Okay. Um, uh, this is Aaron, everybody. Uh, this is the first time I've used this GoToMeeting system. Um, I'll do my best to see if uh, this recorded properly with video and audio. Um, if you happen to have recorded this by video or audio um, and you have a good copy of it, uh, please get in touch with me through Energetic Forum or email me at info at emediapress.com um, and it would be helpful if somebody did make a good recording because I don't know what my recordings are going to look like yet. Right. So uh, that would be much appreciated. Great. So um, again, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Thank you, Eric, for um, making the insane four-day drive trip to uh, get up here and uh, for uh, sharing uh, everything with uh, well, I enjoy it, so yeah, I think everybody else does, so it's good. Good. Um, and one last message. the um, There's a Facebook group set up using Eric's name. If you see those posts coming from Eric, it is not Eric. No, I don't subscribe to Facebooks or emails or any of that stuff. I'm absolutely against it. Sell your telephones, the whole thing. Right. Uh, the so. fact that you even have the coyote in a cage this long is a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, that, that's, that's the other thing we wanted to say is that um, um, Eric does not have an email address. He does not have a computer that's on the internet. He does not have a Facebook account, any of these things. So if you see anybody who is representing themselves as Eric in these venues, uh, please let us know about it. Um, contact Aaron at info at uh, emediapress.com. And we'll just uh, add add these insults to the lawsuit that's uh, um, possibly being developed against these people. So um, thank you again for uh, participating, and have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.